trying out a brand new cutter, to me anyways, the Rhino TW25. It's a beefcake of a cutter. We're gonna put it through its paces today. So let's take a look at how this thing did clean it up this area behind me, and then we'll tell you all about it. You know, so this is a small area that we're, that we're cleaning up today, but it's a challenging area. Challenging on a couple of reasons. Uh, one, a lot of trees in here, so you have to try to navigate. I probably could have taken the loader off and maybe put some, well, I don't have a, a suitcase weight bracket on the front, but need to have some weight on the front of the tractor to offset uh, the weight on the back of the tractor. So I guess I did need to have the loader on there, but it made it harder to navigate. I only whacked a few trees and you'll see the bucket uh, scrape along a few of the trees in here, but it's, uh, it's a trade-off with a big old brush hog on here versus a flail mower. I wanted to use this brush hog though for a couple of reasons. Number one, I have not used a rhino brush hog before and uh, I did some playing around with it already. I've probably put an hour and a half, maybe two hours on it and I wanted to get this area. I thought this was a good area uh, to capture on camera for you folks. But I want to get by a retaining wall as well, a rock retaining wall, and not really comfortable getting right next to it. I don't know how stable the ground is behind it, so I don't want to put all that tractor weight there. And I thought with a flail mower, I'd have to get a lot closer. So with a brush hog, you can kind of reach out quite a ways, and, and uh, that's what you'll see demonstrated here in this video too. Another thing about this rhino though is that it does cut a little bit bigger diameter than the dirt dogs and uh, a two inch max cut diameter on here and and there's definitely some saplings that uh, were creeping up on that two inch mark and there's a lot of deadfall in here too so some um, I don't know if I'd say completely rotted out but dried out limbs and branches and things that have fallen down from the trees around here this area when we when we bought the house is definitely not maintained at all and so I kind of want to I think I'll end up probably using the, the, um, the tree puller on the skid steer and pull out some of these smaller trees in here and open it up a bit too and just let some of the bigger stuff kind of spread its wings a little bit. But I do think it's funny looking at this rhino brush hog on here because or rotary cutter, shredder, slasher, whatever you want to call it, they just are so huge. They're very big and beefy. Um, a lot more steel on there compared to the dirt dog. You know, and of course you're paying for all that extra beef on there and I, I don't know if it's worth it or not. I mean, again, it's a two inch diameter versus an inch and a half cut on the dirt dog. Um, this is like leaving no stone unturned on a brush hog though. I mean, th this is not even their heaviest duty model. This is kind of their mid grade. There's a, uh, a lighter duty and then this mid grade and then a heavier duty as well. And, and Rhino's known for their cutters. They make all sorts of cutters, but they come at a very hefty premium. Now I will say a five foot cutter on a 2038R is a perfect match. It's a very good setup, and this tractor is typically about uh, 52 to 54 inches wide, depending on the tires that you have on there. Now this particular 2038, when I bought it, it did come with wheel spacers installed, so that's pushing it out to about 60 inches wide, matching up with the width of the cutter. Some folks will say, well, you can run a 72 inch uh, cutter on a 2038R, and I think in the right scenario that's true um, but if you're going to ask me just a general recommendation i'm going to say five foot's the right size uh, for this machine the 2030 it's just a good pair it's just a good match and you're never lacking for power you know we're going up and down hills here uh, and it's not not like a crazy hill but it's a hill where you would know if it's going to bog down the tractor or not and it's not bogging it down at all and that's a good thing you can just kind of power through and it's i hate that when you have to baby something to keep it from you know that that RPM is starting to, to weaken and go down. I love it when something's full throttle and you can just give it all you got and it handles it just fine. So again, I, I wanna reiterate that this is a premium price point and if you get one of these and you see it in person, you're gonna think, oh wow, okay, well that makes sense because it, it's just, there's nothing cheap about this at any point on it. I mean, it is, it is overbuilt, <laughs> in my opinion, for what a 2038 a, a compact tractor can do. Um, I don't know the situation, you know, unless you are like the most abusive operator ever, maybe that's when you want to get something so overbuilt like this. I do think the Dirt Dog, and, and that's not to put down the Rhino, but I do think the Dirt Dog being so much less expensive is a lot better value overall. Um, it's not built nearly as beefy as this, but I don't think it needs to be on a compact tractor. It's well, I mean, that's, that's, you have options, right? It's good to have options. A lot of folks love the Rhino. You hear great things about it. I think this rhino's awesome, but I just don't think if they were sitting side by side and I was like, well, do I want to go on an extra vacation and get a rotary cutter or just buy a rotary cutter? I'm probably going to choose the vacation in rotary cutter uh, if it's the same amount of money. 
Now listen to some of these specs for this series here. The PTO requirements for the five foot are gonna be 25 horsepower minimum, 35 horsepower for the six foot and 45 horsepower for the seven. The five and the six foot are gonna have a gearbox rating. So the maximum on there is 65 horsepower. <laughs> the seven foot is a 130 horsepower gearbox rating. That's, that's pretty crazy. There is no shear bolt option again. The slip clutch is gonna be standard. This thing is, it's, again, they're, they're not sparing expenses, all right? That's a 12 gauge top deck that's on here with seven gauge sidewalls or side skirts that go around here. I mean, that thing is just, that's, that's very heavy. And that's why you get to these weights. The minimum weight, if you got this with rubber guards, is 720 pounds, add an extra 40 pounds uh, for the, uh, the steel chains. You get to the six foot setup, you're over 800 pounds. You get to the seven foot setup, you're somewhere between 11 and 1250 pounds. And so I think it's worth keeping that in mind too, that because of how much these things weigh, there could be some of the smaller compacts that are out there that actually can't lift up uh, some of these, these mowers here. And with all that weight, a lot of it being so far away, you can see how long this brush hog is as well. Now, fortunately, for the most part, you don't need to raise it up off the ground, but if you are transporting it from point A to point B, then that could be a challenge. And you wanna, again, have plenty of ballast weight on the front to offset that. Alrighty folks, so this is the Rhino Twister 20 series. This particular model is the TW25, the five foot wide version. It comes in uh, five, six, and seven foot widths. It's gonna be iMatch or quick hitch compatible with both category one and category two. So you're taking a look at it on a Cat 1 iMatch right now. Works on a Spico, works on any Cat 1 or any Cat 2, or you hook it up directly to your three point hitch. You don't need a quick hitch to use it. Common question asked is if a PTO shaft is included with a rear PTO driven attachment and whether that's a, uh, a cutter, a snow blower, a, a flail mower, a tiller, whatever it is, we always include a PTO shaft. So that's not a, uh, a concern there at all. It's gonna come with what you need. Uh, Gearboxes typically are not filled, all right? That's more of a, um, a federal regulation thing where you can't ship uh, gearboxes, the, the fluids in there. They don't like that for whatever reason. So plan on filling up your gearbox full of gear oil uh, when you get that. Typically they are greased on the pivot points. There'll be some zerks like on the tail wheel. That might be the only one that's on here. I don't think there's really any other um, greasable points that are required but always maybe top those off with a shot or two of grease anyway, just to be safe. You're gonna see this is outfitted with front and rear chains that are on here, a heavy duty laminated rear uh, tail wheel that is gonna be adjustable. And this position right here with two bolts, you just adjust that up and down. Uh, and since we're looking at it, made in the USA with US and imported parts, all right? Typically when you see that sticker, what that means is that the majority, there's, there's some rules if you dig up, uh, dig it up, but the, the majority of the product, that means materials and labor has to be done in the USA. Typically things like the gearbox are gonna be imported normally from China. Um, that just seems to be about the only place that gearboxes come from for whatever reason. But other than that, maybe some minor little components here and there are imported, but the majority of it is made and assembled right here in the US. And this will be kind of like a, a free floating pivot point as well. And so that's gonna kind of give and flex as needed Great example right here, uneven terrain all over the place. And when you're changing all those angles, it just gives it more flexibility to try to stay at a consistent angle when it's cutting. And then on the backside, you're also gonna have these tapered edges that kind of allow things to, well, they're not gonna try to just keep on spinning in there. It's gonna allow them to kind of more easily discharge out of the backside as well. And I don't think I need to point this out, but you can see how deep this deck is, it is very deep, it is a high capacity deck. These blades spin really fast underneath there and so it is gonna just pulverize a vast, large quantity of material. And it is of course protected by a slip clutch as well. So folks, that was a dirty, dirty job today. I am covered in dust and it's super pollinating right now. And honestly, I've only sneezed once so far. I can feel another one coming on, but my allergies are somehow doing pretty good. That's when a cab tractor comes in really handy, you know? But overall, I am satisfied, feeling good. I am all over the place with projects and this is kind of like a little one that's nice to knock out. Um, just so much going on here out of, out of the homestead and all sorts of different tools and, and things going on too. But um, yeah, feels good. Knock that out. Probably come back through with that tree puller, pull the other stuff out, rake it out see how it looks. I don't know, go from there, but I think we're transforming it and I'm feeling happy. Now, of course, what we do here is showcase the stuff that we sell, right? I want to be able to speak from experience 
when you're asking questions about this and that and the other thing. And I haven't tried every single attachment that we sell, but I have tried the vast majority of them and trying more all the time too, because I wanna have that real world experience to share, show the things that go right, show the things that go wrong, show what's a good matchup or not a good matchup and, and be able to let you visually see what works and what doesn't. So I'd encourage you to check out all the videos, nearly 700 videos now with tons of different attachments and different projects. Go to our website, goodworkstractors.com. You'll see everything we have to offer. Three-point hitch attachments, front end loader attachments. All of our prices include shipping, rewards, and financing as well. And on that note, I wanna say thank you for taking time out of your day to stop by. And until next time, stay safe. We'll see you soon. Yeah.